Hey everybody, today I want to talk about a conference I attended two days of at the end of February of this year, 2024. It was the Dream Conference in Phoenix, Arizona, co-sponsored with TPUSA, so hosted in um, association with Charlie Kirk and all those types of people. I wanted to get inside and see this type of event for myself with all the rising fears surrounding Christian nationalism and Project 2025 and all that, and just kind of, you know, see the thing for itself rather than taking secondhand accounts. I removed my necklace, I covered my tattoos, and I assimilated the best I could, trying not to betray my biases while also trying to give the most charitable representation possible. This latter objective will be difficult, to say the least. It, it was a rough two days. On the first day, I arrived about when the doors opened, many hours before the first session, and I just spent most of the day looking around the campus and speaking to exhibitors. The property is beautiful, to be, fair, to be sure, clearly a pricey place, piece of real estate and construction, it is tucked away in the side of a small mountain, which the church directly connects to, uses, and calls Prayer Mountain, despite the mountain being clearly labeled as owned by the cities and taxpayers of Phoenix. Indeed, at the end of day three, they were all going to go up there and do some massive prayer over the city. There were uniformed officers at the event who stated they were there helping off duty, but I was honestly expecting more security and some sort of counter-protest. I'm now not even sure if the state at large knows that this is going on, or if, like, the Arizona chapter of the Satanic Temple, I, I don't even think that anybody knew that this was happening. As I expected, there was a contradictory interplay between the church and pop culture. Evangelism is clearly enmeshed with and embracing consumer culture, so game characters, superheroes, and other popular sites could be seen, despite a heavy preaching focus on not assimilating to a so-called sinful culture. What I would call an influencer culture was heavily at play. There was a surprising amount of focus on vanity to me, again despite the call to reject modern culture. Really interesting to see was Marvel's Thor, a Disney-owned, polytheistic-based character who I cannot imagine fits the values of the general audience. The whole vibe was like a rock concert, with unique event merchandise and all. This materialistic and consumeristic angle ran rampant throughout the entire event, as we will see. Most of the exhibitors were focused on education in one form or another. First, getting into school and getting children reintroduced to biblical Christianity. These people are 100% quote-unquote coming for your kids. Then keeping the kids, of course, and preparing them to enter higher education with groups such as TPUSA. At that point, it switches to adult education, training new pastors who then can then go out, create their own churches, and bring more sheep and money into the flock. Some of the tables have truly good goals on the face of it, like stopping human trafficking, which will come up more below. There was also a lot of cringe amongst the tables, though. For example, there was one booth selling woke tears. There was mottos obsessed with communism, asking for prayer back in school. I saw um, a Gadsden flag where the snake had been replaced by a fetus, which is still hilarious to me to this day that these people use the Gadsden flag when their main goal is to tread upon others. There's just so much of this like consumable content to give out to thousands for free. There were also books for sale for most of the main speakers or related ministries and merchandise for each, of course. All in all, though, I did not see or hear anything that truly surprised or shocked me. Like, I knew what I was getting into, I know what Christian nationalism's general goals are and all that. The vibe was honestly pretty chill as people showed up and registered, and I just hung out and people watched for a couple hours. In a way, I was almost disappointed, only because I expected culture shock and just kind of found some expected conservative Christianity. But once stuff got underway for the first evening ceremony, things changed pretty damn fast. <laughs> They opened with blaring music, strobing lights, fog machines, and a 20-minute parade of all the branches of the megachurch that were present. There was a lot of pop culture symbolism mixed in, lots of pro-life signs and everything you would expect. It was intense, but still nothing I had not expected. Larger and louder, but pretty on par. Then came Charlie Kirk of TPUSA himself, and that was when the entire atmosphere just kind of changed. I immediately saw the distance between conservative Christianity and Christian nationalism as these people became riled up by Kirk. He started bragging about getting Trump to Arizona during COVID and how they started hosting Freedom Nights in the state. Another thing that I'm not sure anybody really knows about because I don't think these have ever been protested or anything. Um, basically, he condemned cr Christians who obeyed secular protocols as weak and called upon the audience to actively revolt in the name of Christian nationalism. So-called liberty was his focus. He kept saying that liberty is God's idea, not man's. He claims to stand for liberty and righteousness. Keep this in particular in mind for later, this love for liberty in the name of an omnipotent tyrant. Kirk ended by calling on the church to fix the declining civilization that is modern America. 
The explicit goal of the conference is to make Arizona a Christian state and then the nation. Biblical, not political, is what he said. And this Freedom Night ties into this too. Every single month, they're apparently meeting here and Charlie Kirk hosts some Christian nationalist speaker here in Arizona to try and kind of make it this spearhead for the Christian nationalist movement, which is just freaking horrifying, <laughs> honestly. It was strange to me how these speakers could actually have some decent ideas, such as fighting for liberty or improving society, but then it goes straight to hell when they fall back on Christian nationalist ideas and values. Well, I cannot really describe what happened next, and luckily I don't have to because there is a video of it online, and if you go to the written version of this podcast, it's linked there. Um, I don't want to over-dramatize it as someone who's worked with like abused children as a social worker and studied dehumanization, but it was definitely one of the most cringiest, like eye-bleachiest things I've seen in my life. Like maybe not the most like traumatizing or horrific, but like full soul cringe. A group of what I believe were entirely white students did a sort of interpretive dance to American history after Kirk left the stage. They acted out things like full on acted out Things like being slaves, ruining slave ships, planting a girl as the Iwo Jima flag, reenacting the Kennedy assassination, portraying the fall of the Twin Towers with people jumping out, acting out a violent and careless abortion, and in the end, blaming this all on the lack of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, what I've just described does not even get close to describing the insanity of this like interpretive dance that went on for, I think, at least 10 minutes. And I honestly think I blacked out in the middle of this thing. Um, but like I said, the whole session was recorded. And uh, I would honestly highly recommend you just pause this video or pause reading if you're reading along and uh, follow the link in the that will be in the description. I wanted culture shock and then my gods, did I get culture culture shock? And it made me think of the Stephen Crane quote. I was in darkness. I could not see my words nor the wishes of my heart. Then suddenly there was a great light. Let me into the darkness again. <laughs> I'm not an easily offended guy. And I have to say that my jaw was on the floor. My wife had joined for the free night session, having an entrance since her family was like part of like hardcore racist, you know, kind of Southern Christian cults and her jaw was on the floor. Thank the gods the lights were down and all that because I would have given myself away for sure. It was so surreal, full blown Twilight Zone shit. And by the end of it, the audience went wild and I realized just what an insane situation I'd really found myself in. The speaker on the... Uh, the first speaker that night was uh, Gentizen Franklin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing his name right, so I'm going to call him Franklin. Um, Franklin encouraged the audience towards quote-unquote openness, saying that if Christians open their mind and open themselves to new experiences, this is when God will come to them. I feel safe assuming that this only includes experiences in line with what is already permitted, as per the right-hand path traditions. I doubt that opening yourself to social progress and such things would lead to the God they are speaking of. That would kind of defeat the entire purpose. The contradiction seems completely lost on them, though, just no awareness of the irony. Franklin called for a new revival movement. He wants people to get out there and proselytize and be evangelical again. A common thing was to frown upon, upon so-called weak Christians who obeyed the rules of secularism. And that's that's the whole side thing, is that these people fully embrace like secularization theory and like think secularism is like a real thing, even though like as someone who's kind of like studying Religion, I would say the secularism is kind of a myth, honestly, but that's that's a whole different kind of words. He told the audience that they were never closer to the devil than when they have a sense of pride. Though shortly afterwards, said each one of them is just a little openness away from being a vehicle for the one true God himself. And then, of course, he bragged about his wealth. Homosexuality, transgenderism, the breakup of the nuclear family, declining church numbers, less procreation. All this and more are seen as symptoms of so-called demonic influence, which is in a way, I guess, a compliment. <laughs> The whole thing is in the link above. This is just what really stood out to me the most. I also have to mention his sermon's focus on the first ex on his first experience playing golf. His entire illustration of having faith in oneself was getting a hole in one and not believing that the ball in the hole was actually yours. Now, I mention this because the same church, the Dream City Church, is hosting a golfing event after the concert with a costly sign-up, and surely this is just a coincidence. But it just kind of gives insights into how these people fabricate these stories to you know, manipulate the audience. This gets back to the consumerism and materialism of it all. But then, thank the gods, it was the end of day one and I got to get the hell out of there. Simply watching this stuff on YouTube doesn't really capture the pure energy, though, although I do recommend you watch it. 
you actually have to be there to realize just how crazy and malicious the vibe really is. Not even just the speakers, but the audience as well. All right, so day two was another full day, and the last day I went, I did not go day three. Now, I really didn't want to go back for the second day, but this was where the real meat of the event was, including the main speakers and the ability to choose one out of 50 45-minute workshops for the day that you could join. 9 a.m. is way too goddamn early for the overstimulation of a modern Christian rock concert, and the only possible intent, I realized, can be disorientation and disassociation before the preaching begins. What was truly bizarre to me was their use of Jesus as a magical word or invocation, the quote-unquote most powerful word of all. The first speaker was the head pastor of Dream City Church, Luke Barnett, and without skipping a beat, Luke started by encouraging the audience to buy his new book, as well as the merchandise being sold at the conference. Central to his sermon on was how God has blessed them with so much land, money, staff members, spouses, descendants, and so on. Again, this very materialistic, consumerist, Western culture mindset. I think almost every single speaker touched on these things, especially how much money God had brought them in their churches. They don't seem even slightly aware that this is an assimilation to modern culture rather than any kind of revolt against it. Barnett preached against um, paganism, witchcraft, magic, and all related things, quoting Revelations 2-2 that you quote-unquote cannot tolerate evil men. This tied into a theme that TP USA had at the event, quote-unquote tolerance is not a commandment. I actually agree with both statements. It is why I cannot tolerate people like the Barnetts, TP USA, and the sheep they prey on. You do not have to tolerate the closed-minded nationalistic hate provo provo promoted by groups like this. Simple as that. Funny enough, later speakers in the day would spend a great deal of energy and time complaining that Christian nationalism is not being tolerated by culture at large, along with claims of outright persecution, of course. To put Jesus before everything else, that was what Luke held as the most important takeaway from his sermon, though he only got to this after promoting his own consumer content. Up next was Matt Barnett, whose whole speech was to be a blessing, not a success, quote unquote. This was a big quote Matt put out to the audience before preaching about his success with the church in California. Indeed, it was so successful, people like Kanye West donated money. And while Matt never thought he would be a great pastor, now he has accomplished all this amazing stuff. Good thing we focus on being a blessing and not a success. Second in importance was the need to target the marginalized and needy who have nothing else. That way you can bring them to Christ through helping them. Eventually, you may just be able to convert them and give them a purpose in life. The life that they now owe to Jesus, preaching joining evangelical colleges, selling merchandise. It was this method that led to Matt's success, uh, or blessing, <laughs> I guess. This was hard for me. Helping the marginalized and needy can be an objectively good thing to do, but a broken clock is also right twice a day. Behind this illusion of altruism is a selfishness that just so happens to increase the wealth of the pastors, while also spreading the word of the church. It is a double-edged sword here. How do we condemn malicious malicious religious intent without condemning the actual good these groups sometimes do, even if by accident. Surely there is some way that an all-powerful, all-loving God could help the marginalized and needy without demanding worship, submission, and money? Anyways, this leads well into the next topic, which was a, a panel discussing how to stop sex and human trafficking. I'm not going to get much into this. Again, this is a good idea that ends up having malicious intent behind it. Locking up traffickers and helping their victims is absolutely a noble cause. The broken clock is right for the second time that day. But the more the panel went on, the more it became clear that the goal was to push Christianity, well, more specifically Christian nationalism, on those who are at their lowest, most vulnerable place in their lives. They actually mentioned that God funds those who basically target the marginalized in society. It is the same false altruism as seen with Matt Barnett just before. In the end, there is not much to say. If you are reading this, you, or if you are listening to this, you probably already get the dilemma. Again, surely this omni-deity that just wants what is best for everyone could help end human trafficking without requiring worship, submission, and funding. They also refer to the serpent, which to them is the devil, of course, as the first defiler, even comparing him to like these sex trafficking and sex abusing type of people. I cannot even imagine the mindset required to compare gifting someone with moral knowledge and life to the abuse of children. It is beyond absurd. As Lucifer says in Cain and Mystery, knowledge is good and life is good, and how can both be evil? Now, finally, it was time for the breakout workshop. I chose one called All Conflict is Theological with Seth Gruber, and I did not realize who Gruber was at all at the time, which he's apparently a very famous Christian nationalist who um, runs a podcast called Unaborted. I just saw the name of the class and I knew it was one I had to check out. Now, I gotta say, I hated this guy. 
Just a cocky locker room bro type who often fell back on literal trolling tactics to mock his opponents, who are not there to even respond. I have long said I am a moral realist, and if I ever met a man radiating just vile evil outside of social work, it was this guy. What I found myself in was a modern sermon against Gnostic heresy. I had chosen wisely. You see, apparently all quote-unquote leftism, aka anything not Christian nationalism, is a manifestation of Gnostic dualism, a preference for the conscious will to define one's identity rather than the body. You see, to him, the truth is biological and material essentialism. He really doubled down on Yahweh being this controlling demiurgic god of matter, and it's hard to disagree with that. To him, the body is as, if not more important than the mind, something that actually shocked me. You see, to him, the body is central to identity rather than the will. He blames this preference for the will for things like abortion, transgenderism, homosexuality, euthanasia, transhumanism, and several more examples. For instance, he says that modern society says abortion is okay because the fetus is not a person, as it lacks personhood because it does not have a conscious self. He says that transgenderism is rooted in the idea that what you feel like overrides what you are biologically. Same with homosexuality overriding a supposedly biological drive to reproduce. He sees the root of all this as Gnostic dualism. Now, just to clarify a little, and I'm going to have a follow-up video immediately after this video discussing Gruber a little more in depth, kind of addressing this directly. But the problem here should be obvious. For example, what they would call quote-unquote leftists, which is pretty much everybody listening to this, would say that there's nothing wrong with homosexuality or transgenderism because it is natural, you know, because it comes from, you know, it's it's part of this material self. It, it is kind of a type of biological essentialism. Like, it's not just that you feel like you are something, you, you truly are something. Like, it's not just a choice or something like that. We know that by now. So really, Gruber completely misunderstands what um, secularism and what he calls leftism believe, which would be physical reductionism, like materialism and uh, physical monism, you know? And well, I'll, I'll go into this more in the next video, but I just want to throw this out there that this guy is like really, really confused on what he's talking about. And ironically ends up uh, agreeing with the left a lot, in my opinion. Now, I gotta say I was confused as shit, to be honest. Gruber might be onto something. He's honestly right in a way. It is his view that all these things are somehow bad that disgusts me. The will does override the body. It is more important than nature and biology and matter. I have never been more pro-choice, LGBTQ+, or generally left than when Gruber was saying this stuff. Like, hell yeah, fuck this material world. Will over body, absolutely. Except for this isn't necessarily what his opponents believe. What I found is that Gruber is preaching Yahweh literally as the Gnostic Demiurge, as the God who created and enslaves us to matter, who we must be subservient to or suffer, and he rejects body-spirit dualism. His biggest fear is that if nature does not define personhood, the state will. No, the individual can, should, and hopefully will. Yes, it may be the state to define it, but he's creating a false dichotomy because the whole conference relies on self-rejection and self-hatred, to become a tool for Yahweh and to see yourself as a disgusting sinner in need of saving. It is just as bad for the church to define personhood as the state. Indeed, it is the choice of every individual who is able to make that choice. In many cases, it may be worse for the church to define it than the state. Gruber is also convinced of a so-called slippery slope of tolerance, again tying into the whole theme that we do not have to tolerate so-called evil. As always, he fails to recognize that it is right-hand path tyranny, which best aligns to moral evil. He says that tolerance for sin leads to acceptance of sin, then celebration of sin, and finally participation in sin, which will eventually become force. If you are connecting the dots already, yes, this guy is afraid that he is going to be forced to participate in something like homosexuality, though he does not explain exactly how the state plans to make people homosexual. In the end, his conclusion is that everything goes back to Gnostic dualism, that this great heresy is the center of all that Christian nationalists see wrong with the world. In some ways, I agree. I just see it in the complete inverse of Gruber. What he calls Gnostic dualism is critical to the idea that the mind is greater than matter. But this is not what most people believe. And to him, it is horrifying, whereas to me, it is a sign of great progress. At the same time, we both agree that society is in a state of decline, but I certainly do not agree it is because of individuation. Quite the opposite, individuation is how we get out of this nightmare we find ourselves in, not further centuries of submission to a tyrannical god and demonizing religion. It was funny to me. He claimed that no argument or evidence has ever been given for dualism, which is hilariously false. If you didn't know who he was, you may have even confused him for a militant physicalist on our atheism on Reddit. 
if I had thought it would matter at all, I'd follow up with him. But I'm just going to end up posting it as my own separate rant, pretty much, because I'm sure there's no point. And I realize kind of this section on the Gruber thing might be kind of scattered and maybe I should even remove it, but I'm just going to leave it here and uh, we'll clarify in the very next video. It's my plan. Now, after this, it was in back to the preaching sessions, and this time it was a famous preacher by the name of, of Jack Hibbs, a famous evangelical preacher. Now, I had never heard of this guy, but his whole thing is that he's been banned or something from D.C. for preaching the gospel. And like I said, I didn't really know this guy, and I haven't dove into this much. I probably won't. <laughs> um, Jack really got the persecution complex bubbling up to the surface, claiming that these ultra-wealthy people in the most popular religion in America are being targeted if they so much preach about Jesus and repentance. To Jack, it is clear that anyone who looks at history, to anyone who looks at history, that America was intended to be a Christian nation, and that we cannot and should not separate church and state. In a way, he embraced the term Christian nationalist, accusing the term of being meaningless and made up as anti-Christian propaganda. Jack also believes that the current decline of society is caused by demonic influence, as so many others. This just comes up over and over again. It is far less surprising to me now that a new satanic panic is brewing. There is a very intense and ever-present belief in spiritual warfare going on here. To be frank, we were well over 24 hours in, and my patience and tolerance were wearing quite thin. In fact, during this sermon, I began to draft the first draft of this article and podcast just because I had to start venting it for my system, so my attention really started to slip. Next was a political panel, and talk of election fraud is still going strong, with the first order of business being to call upon the audience to become official pollers for the upcoming presidential elections. They preach that the church getting involved with every level of state is exactly what the founding fathers wanted when they founded the country, making it a duty of sorts of, of sorts as Americans. They told us to simply look at the history to, to look at history to confirm this. So I looked and found all the familiar quotes from our founding fathers about how they hated Christianity and organized religion, as expected. I mean, yeah, just look into this for a couple of minutes, and it's really easy to find. How they literally embraced the serpent and demanded "Don't tread on me" in rejection of Genesis three, where the Serpent is condemned to be tread upon by man and God. The panel said that nationalism is nothing more than a love for one's country and that the negative connotations are essentially a propaganda. Ironically, they started talking about wolves in sheep's clothing and how much the church could never be infiltrated, that outsiders were too afraid to come inside and that demons quake with fear when they pass by. To not burst out laughing was a personally historic show of self-restraint, even more funny for reasons I will discuss more soon. Is because their church makes hell tremble that the church is so quote unquote being persecuted. The most esteemed member of the panel was former politician and lobbyist Bob McEwen, who quote unquote explained that basically every imaginable consumable product advancement, etc., is rooted in the United States, and that if the United States failed, the whole world would fail. Indeed, to McEwen, Satan targets America in specific because surely there's nowhere Christians are more persecuted. You know, they're not like being slaughtered in other countries or anything. Totally not. Because if Satan gets America, the world will follow. I honestly don't think I understood the Christian nationalist view of the country fully until this guy spoke. Perhaps the most insane single idea in the two days in this nightmare world I heard was McEwen saying that the only day which would be on par with Independence Day would be that day of the conference in 2024. Now, the last thing I stayed for was Charlie Kirk's official thing in some Q&A that followed. Again, he focused on liberty against the tyrants of the left who are supposed to be persecuting the church. He condemned Christianity at large for being subservient to so-called so -called secular society for falling in line. He again calls for revival and revolution, saying that we must draw a line in the sand and demand the welfare of the nation, in accordance with Christian nationalism, of course. Again, everything at odds with his view are simply the result of demonic influence. I would say more, but this guy is way more famous than he deserves. You've probably heard of him or heard what he has to say. And he's basically just the program that all the other nationalist NPCs are running on. He's shocking and hateful and all that, and the audience's love for him is perhaps even more frightening. But at that point, I was just completely burnt. I stayed for the first two questions. One where Kirk tore apart a woman for worrying about how to be political without losing tax exemption. And I mean, this woman asked this question, and Kirk literally said something like, Anybody who should be asking that question should like get the fuck out of preaching because they're a joke and they fail and they're not Christian and they're demonic and whatever. Like, and he tried to be like, I'm not talking about you, but I mean, like, he literally said that anybody who's worried about this is like a fake Christian. So, anyways, and the other question he uh, he concluded that the 
quote unquote alphabet mafia, which is a dog whistle for LGBTQ plus, is seeking to groom and recruit children because they cannot reproduce. I literally don't even know what the fuck to say to that. It was just such a perfect culmination and compilation of the endless bullshit I had heard over the past few days, and I was ready to leave that place behind and never look back. So I did. Now, never one to waste an opportunity. Besides knowledge, my adventure was a test of magic in several ways. One of the things I was actually surprised by was it being a test of my ability to blend, to be a chameleon, to hide my inner thoughts and smile not along with ideas that disgust me. Even a few years back, I'd have gotten myself kicked out of that place within the first few hours, probably wouldn't even have removed my necklaces or covered my tattoos. It was a test of growth and resilience, essentially, and might be something I'd recommend, but in a less crazy setting. I also just believe one needs to expose themselves to the evil in this world, as I have written about before. I have a new motto, courtesy of Lord Byron. His evil is not good. I was repeating this constantly inside, and each time it only increased in power. That moment when they were praising God for being so strong that no outsider would dare sit among them, that was obscenely and hilariously empowering. Demons tremble as they pass, they preached, and yet a longtime devotee of the left-hand path not only sat among you, but climbed to the top of your prairie mountain and spoke much po more powerful words than Jesus up there. I even left the long-empowered pentagram upon the peak buried beneath the surface. Now I have to say, the climb made me think of Gnostic dualism and Seth Gruber, because my academic body struggled, but my left-hand path body or er, soul persisted. I rarely use thought forms, but can tell you that my Shaw animal was perfectly happy to roam free within the church. It was interesting, though. I've theorized that successful black magic separates the individual from the right-hand path so much that people just subconsciously avoid you. I had said and done nothing to be outcasted, had no tattoo, tattoos or pendants showing, and was not seen upon the mountain by any, which only had five people on it to begin. But both day two sessions found me with five or more empty seats next to me in an otherwise packed megachurch. The last thing I'll touch on is forcing myself to shake the hand of evil. I don't know why, I just knew I had to shake hands which, with, what, with what, whichever of these speakers I could. On one hand, I just need to know what it felt like. If I'm to study religion, it won't be the last time I speak to a person like that. And on the other hand, I wanted them to shake mine, to know they've interacted with a person like me, even if they don't. Finally, I want to tie this all into my rejuvenated study of Satanism. On one hand, the irony and the liberty against tyranny rhetoric is astronomical. You'd think you were reading the likes of the romantic Satanists. It recalls the French Revolution, or the Satan of Blake, Byron, and Shelley, who rebel against the omnipotent tyrant and curses him with eternal misery. Liberty is antithetical to Christian nationalism, which seeks to force their way upon the world at large. It is antithetical to all true right-hand path ideology because the individual must always remain subservient. The quest for liberty is why the literary Satan of Christianity rebels and falls, why he is damned, why he encourages us to take the free will given by eternal life and knowledge in the Garden of Eden. This goes back to my writing about how ridiculous it is that these people utilize the Gadsden flag. The entire and explicit goal is to tread upon others, to come with a sword as Christ did. They are conquerors, and I'm not just speaking historically, but presently. They seek to conquer us. Charlie Kirk and everybody else do not give the slightest shit about true liberty. They simply want the liberty to dominate for themselves. On the other hand, some of the general ideas are so similar to the nationalistic Satanism of groups like the Order of Nine Angles that it tripped me out, which really helps explain why the liberation left-hand path stuff seems to contradict, as they don't mesh well with far-right ideology in the least. The use of music to create a different state, the call to infiltrate and overtake institutions, the goal of becoming a dwelling place for the divine or acasual to cause long-term or aeonic change, the belief that they need to save a declining society, the alt-right rhetoric, and of course nationalism itself. Obviously, this can apply to plenty of right-hand path groups, but having been studying the Order of Nine Angles for a term paper, I just kept thinking back to them when listening to these people talk and how they acted. In the end, I expected the whole thing to be rather banal and expected, but it had a significant impact on me. These people are everywhere. They are of malicious intent. They are the reality behind the satanic panic BS they spread as a form of projection. Everything they accuse Satanism of is what they are doing, to, doing themselves, worshiping human sacrifice, infiltrating the government to force society into their religion, sneaking into schools, targeting children. There is indeed a somewhat underground evil world dominating cult to panic about, and that is Christian nationalism. The Dream Conference succeeded in its goal. I feel spirit, spiritually moved and moved towards activism. I just doubt it's the way they intended. These people need to be countered. I actually somewhat understand the importance of lesser evils now. 
I've even been considering trying to contact TST or the news to see if we can get protests at Freedom Night and stuff, news coverage or anything. But more than that, I feel the call of Satanism again. Have you ever heard someone say the term, I will give you something to cry about? These groups are already taking the action they would if they were being persecuted. And they themselves state that tolerance is not a commandment, that we cannot tolerate evil men. So let's not tolerate it. We don't need this childish, dress up trolling Satanism we think of now, but a very serious and mature form that can counter this nonsense without falling to their level, without becoming who they've become. We need a true rebirth of the romantic Satan, not some dark, Christianized polytheism, nor some edgy, childish trolling. A romantic, intellectual, literary, and active Satanism intent on actually countering this instead of just making headlines and money or hiding in the shadows. Do not misunderstand me. I do not retract my condemnation of theistic Satanism nor of certain atheistic groups. The devil is a Christian invention in fiction. He and demons are not our gods, nor can they ever be freed of Christianity. Thus, Satanism should be embraced as a direct response to Christianity and nothing more, a tool in the toolbox. I'm not encouraging people to believe in some objectively existent, esoteric entity named Satan, but rather the literary Satan in response to the literary fiction that drive things like Christian nationalism. At the same time, it is long past due that we drop all the childish, edgy, vile imagery that almost all satanic groups and individuals seem to remote and replace it with the centuries of rehabilitation to a shining being of actual liberty and individualism.